Hello everybody. It is a beautiful March evening. The sun is going down. It's 6.45 or so. And it is just lovely out. It was nice and warm and sunny. and It's just, it's just been a good day. So I just wanted to uh, walk you guys through the current state of the carnivorous plant collection. So we'll start here with the bogs. So the bogs are for the temperate plants. These are the plants that require a winter dormancy that are hardy outside, but they still need a special setup because unlike traditional plants, these grow in nutrient poor soils. So basically just like peat bogs that are very low in nutrients, which is the whole reason they, ad they evolved to, uh, to digest bugs in the first place to get their nutrients. So this first bug here is my older one. I have two, of course, and they are, uh, I guess, technically three at this point, but two of them are actual bugs, and the third one's a uh, kind of. But anyway, let's get started. Let's start looking at them. So as these are guys are all just coming out of their dormancy. The only one that's been actively growing is the Saracenia purpurea. But uh, this one was a it was a Venus flytrap rescue that I got. That's not doing too great. It's the only one that's given me issues. So we'll see what happens there. But this is Saracenia ex excellens, which is Leucophylla and minor. This is the newest uh, picture here, and it's still growing, and you can see how much bigger it is compared to the smaller, older ones. And then there's several new ones. But these these guys were cute little pictures, cute little baby pictures. Uh, this is just a little Drosera spatulata that I rescued out of some moss. Since and then this is, this is not a carnivorous plant, but I planted it in here anyway. This is a bogwort, which is a little orange flowered thing. And this was a little baby that was inside some moss that I got with the spatulata. And I planted it in here at the suggestion of the people I got from. And then this is Saracenia dixie lace, which is a Cytocena hybrid. And a small, it's a pretty like, compact Saracenia. So it's got some nice pitcher growth. There's a lot. A lot of pitcher growth starting down there. These are my two fly traps. I'm trying to keep it in focus. Uh, this one was the first one I actually got. This one was a half dead rescue at Lowe's, and I planted it in here. And it's look how much it's grown. It's looking pretty good. And then this one was from Home Depot. This was a big pot of what well, looked like a several crowns, and I just kind of planted them in here, and they're doing pretty well too. And I've even got two flower stems. At this one, oops, there's this one here, and then there's another one right at my fingertip there. And then there, this has got some beautiful little traps on it. Some of the yeah, sm the smaller crowns are starting to develop bigger traps. Uh, this is Purpurea venosa, or subspecies venosa. This is the newest pitcher here. It's huge compared to the others. These two were actually the oldest, or the biggest pitchers before. And so what I've noticed is the newer pictures are, are, are stay pretty green, even in full sun. You'll see some red marks on them, like this one, but not a whole lot. But as they age, like this one's a little bit older, and this one is the oldest of the new ones since I got it. And they, they, they get some nice red color with some red veination on them. But they start pretty green, but this is a nice big one. And this is another one that's just opening. Not not as big, but still pretty com pretty comparable. This is Saracenia Judith Hindle, which is, I think it's Leucophylla, uh, Purpurea, and I can't remember the other one, but it's, it's got several species in its background. And then this one here with the nice new pitcher growing, this is Saracenia Leucophylla. This is a classic type, the white top pitcher plant. It's a young plant, but I, I got it, and it's putting out more new pitcher growth, but this is the first new pitcher it's grown for the year, and it's fabulous. So that's this picture. So these are a lot of young plants. Judith Hindle is actually a mature plant. That's a, they don't get very tall. I cut the tops off the, the dead tops off the pictures for spring, so that it was a little bit taller. But they'll grow in with time. The fly traps and the purpurea will stay pretty small, as will the Dixie lace. But the excellens and the Leucophylla will get decent size. In the second bog here, I got some larger plants. Well, this has a couple large plants, the Leucophylla and the excellens, but. Uh, this one's from all entirely larger plants. We've got Saracenia minor, which has got a nice new picture on it. Minor's cool, and you can kind of see it here. 
on the back of the picture. They don't look super impressive from this angle, but there's these little windows. But let's see if I can get it to show on this one. Yeah, you can kind of see it inside the mouth of the pitcher. The light shines through those windows and tricks the insects into thinking there's a way out. And it exhausts them in the process. Uh, this is... Get back in focus. Get back in focus. Come on. This one is Saracenia bug bat, which is a... I believe it's a minor hybrid. It looks very similar to minor, but with huge fat pitchers. Got some nice pitcher growth on that. Saracenia flava has been giving me a little issue. This, the top of this pitcher died back, this new new pitcher, and the same's happening with the next one, so I don't know what's wrong there. It's the only one giving me issues, but flava is uh, the yellow pitcher plant. There's a little baby as well. This is the Leucophila all red, and this, this is a pitcher from last year. Uh, this is a division. Uh, so you can see it's dying back, but the what what health live tissue is still remains up at the top You can see how red it is and the leucophila all reds noted for being well red uh, This is cool because I believe that I believe this one comes from the native population. This is Saracenia aleta This is the one of the older pictures and then this is it's got some new picture growth going on Which is great no, Aleda is native to the like the East Texas bog, like the bogs in East Texas. So normally, what I do with these, for anyone wondering what this pot is for, each one has one. This is the water sink. The, the water table I can see through these holes in the bottom. But what I do with this is I I pour water into it to fill up the water table. I use only rainwater or distilled water. Only those. Can't use anything else, or else it'll kill the plants. So uh, I, what I do right now in this part, in this stage of growth, once, since it's spring and they're actively growing and expanding and developing, I fill it up about an inch to almost two inches, and then I let it soak up and then w let it sit for a day or two with the water table being soaked up before I add more. They like to stay pretty wet. That's why they grow in the bogs. They, they stay pretty wet. They don't like to dry out hardly at all. So I have to keep it wet, to keep the, the peat wet. This is uh, a sand layer, a coarse sand layer with a mixture of peat, 50% peat and 50% sand underneath as the substrate. And this drains really well, it doesn't, but it also doesn't compact and doesn't sit like sopping. Because they don't grow in pure water. They grow above a water table in a soaking media, but it's, the media itself is not water. So they still require that solid media and a little bit of air. But this just this sand layer on top just keeps helps keep the peat down. Like you can see it's poking through in a couple spots where I was digging around to plant the plants down. But this the sand keeps peat from splashing all over the plants. This guy here is a, I'm I'm probably not gonna plant it in the bogs yes just yet, but if I do, it's going here. This is Saracenia X areolata. This is a new pitcher that just popped open, so it hasn't quite expanded out yet. But areolata is, the, is a hybrid between Aleda and Leucophila. But this X areolata is from the Watson Preserve, which is a carnivorous plant uh, and other uh, rare species preserve in East Texas, where uh, the owners of Pet Flytrap were pretty much all of, actually every single one of these came from. Uh, they work up there a lot, a lot, and help maintain the plants there. The uh, the story behind the X areolata here is that a someone wrongfully, either probably unintentionally though, uh, introduced a non-native Leucophila because it's not native to this part of the country uh, to the population of of Aletas, the Saracenia Aletas, which is I think this what this one came from. Uh, to the population and they interbred creating this hybrid and this hybrid being being that it was a hybrid overtook Because a hybrid vigor overtook the native Aletas and started weeding the Aletas out as it as it overtook their territory so and to preserve the Aleta population we uh, we went through and pulled out the ex areolatas and the Leucophila once it was found I believe and because they're not native here, and we're going to lose the Aleda if we do if we don't do something. So, but they didn't want to throw these plants away, so they cultivated them and have some available for sale. And I bought this one. It's a single rhizome piece. It was planted already in this pot. I didn't have to replant it, but I'm going to probably eventually. 
got two growth points actually one small one here that's growing a little and then this main one which put out this first picture it's a beautiful hybrid it's just under shame that this population of them was starting to kick out the native alatas now this over here is my drosera bug there's two species in here uh, you can pretty much tell which one's which because they're pretty starkly different in, in color the light, lighter bright green ones are Drosera bermanii, and the darker clusters are Drosera spatulata. Uh, bermanii tends to grow more independently like that, and spatulata tends to mound on itself, which is why you see a lot of them with mounds. Not all of them, but some of them. And they're flowering. We've got lots of uh, uh, flower stems from the uh, spatulatas coming up. Let's see if I can get... You see, there you got the pretty good close-up. You can see all the gnats and stuff on it and the dew. Vermonti eyes, I think, one of my favorites of the small ones. Let's get back to focus. But I've also got a little pot in there, although what I often do is I pick it up when I water, just so I can drain the water in. But the Droceras don't need to be sitting in water the way that the, or like with the, with a water table the way that the Saracenia bugs do. So I have to, I have to keep it wet, but I don't have to keep it sitting in water, so I have to water it a little bit more. But now, let's move on to the Nepenthes. So I'll be right back. Okay, so here we are in the greenhouse. I got some exciting plants that we'll be showing up in future videos that are starting to bloom. But for now, the focus is on the carnivorous plants. So in here, we have, uh, there's five plants, five carnivorous plants in here. So the, the, most of them were in here. The, the Nepenthes were all in here at one point, but I moved them out uh, today and last night to enjoy the the perfect weather we're having for them. So this first one here, which actually just popped open this new picture just the last couple days, this is Nepenthes Gaia, which is a relatively new hybrid. There are some bigger specimens, but there aren't a ton of them. But mine is a small plant, but it's still producing some adorable little pictures. Now Gaia is a, it's, it's Kaisiana, Maxima, and I believe Berkii? Or Ventricosa, one of the two. But it's a beautiful plant. Beautiful little plant, adorable little round, rounder leaves. Very colorful, interesting little pictures. And this one I got just like a couple months ago at this point. This is Nepenthes burkii. Here's a nice picture on it. This is from the Hal the Halcon, which is a, a, a part an area in Indonesia, I believe. This one and so this is a this is a very closely related species to the Ventricosa, which is one of the parents in the popular uh, and very easy to grow Ventrata hybrid. But this is uh, Berkii. I think that I don't think the hood stays this like dipped down normally. I think just because where the way this one sits and had formed, the pitcher lid was held down a little bit by the stem. But they're interesting, cute little pictures with a, with a small set of wings, uh, those little frilly bits on the front of the picture here. The adorable little rounded, tubby, shiny pictures. Ow, pictures. <laughs> Just banged my head on the roof. Uh, the third Nepenthes that is in here is actually over here. This is Nepenthes ramaspina crossed uh, Rob, or Rob Kaplan, um, Ryan Wartiana. There's a new picture forming there. There's a nice picture there, but this is the newest one here. And the reason I like this and got it, and this was just a couple weeks ago that I got this one, is because look at that picture. It's like a darker exterior. It's a little bit darker looking in can like in person, but it's a dark exterior with a bright green peristome and inner picture surface. It's a beautiful plant, lots of pictures on it. And it's a, it's a uh, Rhinortiana is famous because it's uh, it's pictures that they say can be fairly, relatively plain looking when they're younger, but when they start to grow a little bit, they produce these dark green eye spots inside the pitcher. There's like two of them, and it's really cool for that reason. And I think it's I think it's an interesting little plant. But the other two carnivorous plants that are in here are Pinguiculus. Now this one had a sad history with me so far. This is Pinguiculus sethos, which is a hybrid. Uh, it was it looked a lot better before, but then I watered it and washed it out of the pot somehow. They're, they're pretty shallow rooted plants, and so I had to replant it and hope. And it is growing back, you can see that, but it doesn't look too great yet. But the other one that does look really great is Pinguicula Clone number one. This is just a common, like, simple one. 
I, I wanted to try simple before I went to any more advanced pinguiculas, and this one looks super good. Look, like it's got new leaves growing. It's grown several new leaves since I got it, and it's attracted lots of things, including that moth. And they, it's just such a pretty little plant. But now let's go to the Nepenthes outside, shall we? If I can get the camera to focus back on the nature. There we go. Okay, here we are. So the Nepenthes are outside, the big ones are, the hanging basket ones anyway. Uh, they are all outside, and they are in two spots. One is over on the other side near the apartment there, and then the other is over here behind the greenhouse in the yopons. I leave link to the yopons anyway. But I've got, so I've got this big one. This is a Ventrata. A Ventrata is a very easy to find mass produced clone, uh, hybrid. There's typically one, I think, one or two clones that are typically produced. They're both, they're all female and they're all sterile. There are a few uh, line bred ones that aren't sterile, but they're supposed to all be sterile. Mine, unfortunately, is one of them. Supposedly, anyway. It is female. It's bloomed this one stem, which I didn't expect to happen, but I got lucky. It's a, it's a big mature plant in the vining stage, but it's got this flower stem, which is, this is, if you've ever, if you've never seen an Apenthes before, this is what a flower stem looks like, a female one. A male one will have round bead-like flowers on the stem. These are a little bit more oval shaped, and they're, uh, they have a bright yellow uh, stamen in the center. But Nepenthes are either male or female. They're not like some plants where they can produce male or female flowers, sometimes simultaneously. They, they're either male or female, and that's all they are. So this one's a female. This one here, I've got to reach up a little bit to look at it. There's a tree in the way. This is Ventricosa. Come on, focus. This is Ventricosa. You can see this picture. This is the newest picture to open. It's got a little bit of its characteristic picture ruffle on the peristome. But Ventricosa is one of the parents of Ventrata, and this is a Ventricosa red pitcher, as the tag shows. And it's noted for having these bright, like, like it's kind of like almost cherry red and brighter light uh, pitchers. This is my first Nepenthes, like I've had that I've here seriously had, and it's, you, and it's one of the larger ones that's in the basket, other than the Ventrata, which is, that was gifted to me not too long ago. Oops, I just got some of the sticky sticky stuff on me it's cut it, they these pitchers will pitchers will often if they're if they're happy pardon me exude like nectar like nectar like stuff on various spots sometimes on, like just outside the pitcher some on the peristome you can see how shiny it is in the sun and the sunlight and if you if i catch it at the right time like it's it's not always there there's there might be a little bit i think there is yeah there's a little bit of nectar hanging down from the pitcher hood you can kind of see it if I tilt the pitcher hood back, but this is a this is the largest uh, pitcher it has produced so far. Sang Nepenthes sanguinea, and it's got this one that it's currently working on, which is uh, I think already about as big as this one, so it's probably going to surpass it a little bit. But this is a beautiful species. It's really easy going. This is one of the easiest species to grow, I find. It's it's. Only it's never really given me any fuss, and it's always been super, uh, rel like reliable on pitchers. There was one period where it slowed down a little bit, but it's growing so many new ones, and it grows so many leaves, and there it's grown a lot of pitcher or like leaf and pitcher leaf jumps, which is the, the it's just the term that we call that we give to uh, the difference between the previous leaf that that pitchered and the next one. Like in this one, this is the first picture it produced after after its little break, it's fairly small. Then it produced this one, which is a little bit bigger. But then after at the next leaf up on the stem, so you get to focus on it again. The next next leaf up on the stem did that, and so it is absolutely amazing. I just love it. But anyway, this one is. See if I can get a good look at the picture, the new picture on it. This is Nepenthes talangensis cross sibiensis. Adorable little tubby pitchers with beautiful color and shape. This one is interesting because it's it has produced uh, three basils actually, which Nepenthes don't usually basil unless until the, either the tip is damaged, the growing tip, or it's reached the vining stage, which you can see on the Ventrata, it's got several. Uh, basil's growing up. 
but this one produced th three for not really any obvious reason. Here's another, here's a brand new pitcher that it's working on right here. And there's another one about to form. But it's, it's a beautiful, easy growing hybrid. Sibiansis is one of my favorite species, and what it does with its hybrids is it makes them super, like, tubby. This is an older pitcher that's starting to fade, but you can see, like, it's a small pitcher, but it's pretty tubby for a small pitcher. Uh, this one here, I wish it had a fresh pitcher to show you, but alas, uh, the pitcher that it had uh, started dying. Uh, it was an older pitcher, and it had been changed. Cha its environment had been changed, which is this happens. But you can still see some of the color at the base of it. It's it, it was this dark, like nice red with red other red spots. This is Boshiana cross Mira. You can see the exact like clone cultivars you used there. It is looking like it's going to produce another pitcher there. But these are nice sized pitchers and beautiful red with a flared red peristome. Uh, this one's a, ni a neat little one. This is Mariliana cross Aristolachioides, which is known for its... Uh, Aristolachioides is known for the pitcher opening being on the side rather than the top of the pitcher. And, so, and it's also very short and tubby. So as you can see with this pitcher here, it's very short and tubby. It's very egg-shaped. And the and the pitcher opening is you can see it's like it's not directly at the top. There's a little bit of a hump before the pitcher opening, whereas on others like Sanguinea, it's like right at the tip. In Sanguinea's case, the tip elongates up to a point, but like in Talangensis cross Sibiensis here, even on the old one, it's pretty much just like right at the top. So this is a pretty one. It's got two pitchers open right now, and it's starting to produce a third over there. The Aristolachioides is not an easy species, but its hybrids fortunately are. So this one up here that I'm going to have to grab down. This one's my rare, one of my rare gems. This is Nepenthes sibiensis cross Hemata. Hemata, for those of you who know, and to tell you guys about those who don't, Hemata is known for its very toothy pitchers. They're very, like, the peristome is very dark, almost black in some, and it's very strongly toothy. And so pe people use it in hybrids because even though it's more of a highland plant, it's, uh, it, it typically seems to like absorb a lot of the temperature requirements of the other parent when crossed, it seems like. So their crosses, their chromatic crosses are super easy. This pitcher unfortunately got damaged. Uh, the, t the Penthes rack took a fall a while ago. But the plants are fine, it just damaged that pitcher. But that's, that's one of the pitchers there. But it is producing another. It's a very, it's a happy, vigorous little plant. And so I'm super proud of that. It was uh, $65. <laughs> uh, and the Penthes, Hamada itself, like I saw some small Hamadas uh, for sale on eBay once. And they were, I think, like almost 250 bucks. And then I saw like, uh, they're not cheap is what I'm saying. But those are the Nepenthes that are hanging over in this set of trees. And if I go past the Spanish moss tree, which is a pin oak, I believe, that it's got those hanging off of, I've got a few more over here. Now, the other rare gem sits over here, and that's this one. Look how beautiful this picture is. This is Nepenthes maxima cross Sibiensis. I have a pure maxima, and you'll see it in a moment. I don't have a pure sib yet, but I plan on getting one the moment I can find one. But this is such a beautiful plant. It's the both, best of both worlds, quite literally. Very dark red pit, uh, peristome and very wide peristome. And a beautifully intricate lid. But it gets the, the squat uh, tabiness from the Sibiensis, uh, particularly the squat cultivar. And then it's got a dark clone of Maxima as its female parent. And that gives it the strong coloring. You can see how beautiful that patterning is. It's all the way around. And then it's got, it's, but it's got the shape of Sibiensis with a little bit of Maxima influence. And then it's got Maxima's color. The Sib is fairly plain. Like it's not super plain, but it's a light pinkish uh, body with a red peristome. Uh, Nepenthes Miranda, which is a very easy, fairly popular, but very large growing hybrid. It's a Maxima cross. I, it's, I think it's generally accepted to be math, uh, Maxima and Northiana with some, maybe some other background. But this is the newest pitcher it's produced, and it's, you can see how big it is. 
Now this isn't even the biggest. They can get up to a foot. This is about seven inches from, from the tip of the hood or the, the top of the pitcher where the hood is down to the very base where it connects to the plant. But you can see it's Maxima influence in it with the striking body color and the dark red peristome again. But Miranda is very big. It gets very big. Mine is a young basket plant and already it's got a seven inch pitcher. But it has some other like smaller pitchers. It's got two, uh, two crowns in here. They're the same plant that was trimmed back. You can see it. And it grew two basils. So I get two, double the amount of pitchers. But there's a smaller one. This is from the smaller crown, which is the one in the front. And this one comes from the bigger crown. They're just so beautiful. That's why I love Nepenthes. Over here, this is Maxima cross Vogelii. It's working on this pitcher and this pitcher. It did open this pitcher, but it was tiny and mutated. Like, it's got a big, like, bowl-cut lid. And it's very, very small. But it's, it is a beautiful hybrid. Vogelii is very tall and skinny. And, like, dark, like, light, like a rich green with dark, dark, blackish, purple uh, markings. And then Maxima is a taller, with a, with a little bit of a flare, uh, pairs them with the dark red, a lot of dark red coloring. And this plant is a beautiful cross of the two. Very narrow, tall, skinny, uh, richly colored pitchers. And you can see it on this one, and it's not even open yet or fully developed. And then the last one that I have is Maxima. This is Nepenthes Maxima up here. This is the Borneo Exotics Best clone, which is noted for its spectacular form and color. This is a young plant, of course. But it is producing some nice pictures. That's the newest one here, the one that's standing up that I'm trying to get to stay in focus. But you can see the influence that it has over other parents or other crosses. You can see like that rich coloring and the shape. And that that's imparted to a lot of its crosses. But it's got a nice new picture beginning here. And it's just one of my favorite species and so versatile. And I have like a lot, of, I think over half of my plants, or exactly half, I think, are Sib or Maxima crosses. And then this one, of course, is both Sib and Max. Oh, God, that's so beautiful. So big. This is a, this is a big picture. But uh, yeah, so that's my Nepenthes. Uh, and that's my entire uh, carnivorous plant collection as of right now. Let me walk back over to the bogs. It's a little bit of a lengthy video, but I can't help it. They're everywhere and there's lots to talk about. But I do hope you guys enjoyed, uh, and I hope you guys are encouraged to try some carnivorous plants because they're super fun. Uh, I did. A, I am planning on doing a how-to on bog making, but it will probably be on Facebook because I already made the the second bog, which I used for photos to make a how-to. But it is uh, it's actually super fun, super rewarding. They're super cool plants, special like very special plants. And what, depending on what your environment is like, hello airplane, uh, depending on what your environment is like, the airplane pass. there we go, the plane's passing, sorry about that, uh, depending on what your environment is like may influence what uh, carnivorous plants do best for you. Like if you grow in southern Florida, which I hope to one day, uh, carnivorous plants like Saracenias and Venus flytraps will probably not do super well. This is because they require a winter dormancy. And in Florida, southern Florida, what's winter? <laughs> It'll get down maybe into the 50s usually, like rarely, apparently. But um, it, they just won't do well because they don't get that winter dormancy. But that's where uh, tropical pinguiculas and tropical nepenthes come in. Because they are super easy to grow in tropical environments and warm environments. They don't require a dormancy and they're super colorful and rewarding. But if, you're, if you grow in colder places or can't sustain the warmth that Nepenthes typically require, even some of the highland ones want to be warmer than some places can provide, uh, then that's where these come in. They're hardy in a lot of different climates. Some are let more than others. Papuria, for example, has cultivars that range all the way up to... Uh, 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 Eastern Canada, where, where it's super, where it's pretty cold for a lot of the year. So they, there are some varieties that will work for you. But uh, I get all mine. This is a, a plug for them because I love them. 
uh, from PetFlytrap.com. They are local to Texas, just down from me actually, and they are so they have such high quality plants. Uh, every single one of my or of my uh, carnivorous plants, except for Sanguinea, and that was before I found them. So if I had found them, I would have gotten it from them. Uh, every single one of them came from Pet Fly Trap. My all my bog orchids uh, or my, my bog plants. Uh, the Drosera, I think, came from them. I say, I say, I guess I should have should not have included them because I'm not sure. But they came from a, a a carnivorous plant friend of mine, who gave me them in exchange for an orchid I traded her. But pretty much every every one of them, and possibly even them, came from Pet Fly Trap. And Pet Fly Trap is an amazing source. Uh, highly suggest you check them out and and maybe pick up something for your collection. They have superior shipping, superior plants, and it's just so amazing. Right now, in fact, they started until the 15th of March. This video will be uploaded the night of the 10th. They are having a Venus flytrap sale. All, uh, all varieties of flytraps are 20% off. And they've got some cool ones, including the alien variety, which looks, the, the traps kind of resemble uh, the alien mouth from uh, the movie uh, Predators vs. Aliens, or whatever it is. Uh, the alien movie. <laughs> I, you can tell I don't watch those movies, but it's it's known it's known because of resembling the monster from that movie. Uh, so it's pretty cool. So I hope you guys check hope you guys check them out and enjoy them. And I hope you guys enjoyed this longer, but hopefully neat and and somewhat informative video. I will talk about their culture in a future video. If you have any questions about their culture, leave them in the comments below, and I will make sure to address them both in the comments and in a video in the future. Thank you guys for watching, and I do hope you enjoyed this video.